Hey guys, it's the Informed Historian. Thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day to spend some time with me. Today I thought I would tell you a story that's very personal to me. This is my most personal connection to the war through my third great-grandfather, Private George Thomas Harding. Now, a little bit about my ancestor. He was an illiterate blacksmith. He had no formal education that I am aware of or have been able to be shown, but he did manage to become a blacksmith, although he couldn't read or write. Before the Civil War broke out, he was living in Arvonia, Virginia. He had already married his wife in 1858, and he was part of a pre-war militia, which eventually became Company B of the 41st Virginia Infantry under Captain Benjamin Hatcher Nash. And Mr. Nash was a Virginia state senator at the time, and he had the entire company sworn into Confederate service on the Capitol lawn there in Richmond, Virginia. As a member of the 41st Virginia Infantry, my ancestor saw a lot of major battles as he was attached to the Army of Northern Virginia. But I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that because I'm not here to talk so much about the regiment as I am my ancestor. If you are interested in learning more about the regiment and their activities as a group during the war, I highly recommend this book on the 41st Virginia Infantry. It's part of the Virginia Regimental Series. Um, it's a great resource if you want to learn about the 41st as a regiment. But my ancestor uh, will skip a lot of his uh, wartime service because it's actually what happens towards the end that is the most interesting and the most personal to me. And you'll understand why at the end of this video. So he serves honorably with the 41st Virginia Infantry all through the war until he becomes a prisoner of war in late October 1864 near the Boydton Plank Road. This was sometimes called the Battle of Burgess's Mill. And basically what happens here is their commander, General William Mahone, managed to flank the second corps of the Union Army under General Winfield Scott Hancock uh, really badly. They actually managed to get behind the Union lines. But the difference was from the last time that Mahone had pulled this trick off, the Union Second Corps were veterans now. So rather than breaking and running, they recognized what was happening and managed to cut off these soldiers who had managed to get behind their lines and take them prisoner. And among these prisoners was my ancestor, George Thomas Harding. So after he was taken prisoner, he was sent to a place called Point Lookout, Maryland. And if you know anything about that, that was not a fun place to be a Confederate soldier. I had several ancestors myself die there as prisoners of war, but George managed to stay alive until he was exchanged at Aiken's Landing on March 28, 1865. He and nine other lucky privates managed to get exchanged for one Union officer. This is where my ancestor makes a decision that would impact the course of my history. Rather than return to the army, he decided he was just going to go back home. He acknowledged that the war was over. It wasn't going to do him any good to be one man going back to the army. So rather than trying to locate his regiment, he starts home to Arvonia to his wife and his family. Along the way there, he stumbles across a bag of seeds that had spilled along the side of the road, so he scooped up a handful of them and put them into his pocket. When he got home to Arvonia, Virginia, he planted those seeds to keep his family from starving in post-war Virginia because they knew things were about to get really bad. He continued to plant those seeds for the rest of his life until he died in 1923. He is buried on the family farm, and it is under the care of a neighbor who lives there now, and I'm very grateful to him for allowing me access to visit his gravesite and my family gravesites while I'm down there. Tip of the hat to you, sir. Thank you very much for taking care of my family grave in my absence. But the tradition of growing those seeds continued on. His son, John William Harding, who was a slate miner, uh, continued the tradition. My great-grandmother, who we all affectionately called Grandma Jones, her maiden name was Harding, of course, she was 15 years old when George died. So I have met somebody, and I have hugged somebody, who met and hugged her grandfather, 
who was my Civil War ancestor. But she continued to grow those seeds. Then my papa, my grandfather, my dad's dad, continued to grow those seeds. And to this day, we continue to grow these seeds that he referred to as collard beans, because if you look at this picture of them here, you'll see that they are multiple collars. But it's a tradition that started because my ancestor started on his way home from the Civil War rather than continuing to fight a war that he knew was already lost. And it's given me something that I can look back on and acknowledge a piece of my family history, and it's something that I look forward to passing down to my daughter, Hazel May, one day. And perhaps she'll join me in the garden with planting these seeds here in a couple of weeks when the last frost has passed us. So if anybody cares to see updates on the garden and how the beans do this year, uh, leave me a comment below and I'll take a look. And if it's something that you guys are interested in, I'll be more than happy to oblige and tell you guys a little bit more about our garden and show you how they're coming along. So I'm going to start wrapping this video up. I've kept you long enough. I appreciate you taking some time to listen to my sentimental story of my ancestors and their gardening habits and how we continue it to this day. And I hope you all have a wonderful day out there. It looks like it's going to, looks like it's an absolutely beautiful day. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Take care, God bless, and I will see you at the next Uniformed Historian site.